Inspiration, clarity, confidence, and wholehearted business strategy. Welcome to Your Next Chapter, the podcast especially for women in their 40s and beyond who know that business and personal development go hand in hand. Tune in each week for marketing, mindset, and personal growth strategies, along with inspiring stories from women around the world who are creating new businesses and lives that are personally fulfilling and financially rewarding. If you're looking to create a business and life you love, you're in great company. Let's find out what will unfold in your next chapter. I'm your host, Angela Raspis, and I'm so delighted that you're here. Hello and welcome to episode 35 of the Your Next Chapter podcast. This is Angela Raspis. Now today I'm having a conversation which I'm sharing with you with an absolute dynamo of a woman from Minnesota in America. Her name is Rebecca Flansberg and she is known as Frantic Mummy. Mummy spelt the American way with an O as opposed to the U for for us Australians. Now Rebecca has a fantastic story to share which I know is going to provide you with an enormous amount of of motivation. Now why is that? Well it's because Rebecca worked in one industry for almost 30 years, selling office products with two great organizations, but she started to feel really stuck and wanting something different. Does that sound familiar? So what Rebecca did was she woke up basically one day. She had gone to a conference where she heard about this whole new industry called VAs or virtual assistants. Now what Rebecca realized was that she had all of these skills that she hadn't recognized before and could actually repackage those into her own business. Now she'd already been, um, in her words, a dedicated blogger. She'd been blogging for quite a long time and as a result of that she'd become quite adept at all the different online tools that a lot of other people weren't. And there's where the gold was. It was looking and recognizing these skills and then repackaging them into a new business where she does writing and helping with social media management, project management, content creation, and creating bios and about pages for her clients. She's also freelance writing for some magazines as well. Now, this was this moment of flash of inspiration, as Becky explained to me, but she still realized that at this beginning time of her business, she didn't know how to package herself, she didn't know how to market herself, but she didn't let that stop her, because we're all beginners at the beginning of our business, that's why it's a beginning. But the beautiful thing about Becky is her willingness to show the way for others. She's packaged up all of her insight into a great getting started as a VA. I'm Guide, and you'll find the link in the show notes on my website, which is just angelaraspis.com forward slash 35, so that you can get hold of this resource for you. And don't be stuck in the paradigm of thinking that VAs are only people who work with online social media, etc. The message that Becky really wanted us to, to understand is that whatever knowledge you have in your brain, whatever experience you have in your life, There is someone in the world willing to pay you for that. It's just a case of you beginning to look at what those skill base and experiences are that you've had and then see what the opportunities are in the market that you can match them up with. Now, often starting in this new direction can be quite confronting and and a bit of a challenge. So that's why I actually created one of my key services, which is a clarity session. It's you and I spending 90 minutes together, be it face to face here in Sydney or over Zoom. I can help people from all over the world. Now in that session, we get really clear on what are your skills? What can you do with them? Who might be a client for you? How might we package what it is that you have to offer? And putting together a very succinct and starting point marketing action plan what I call a progressive engagement plan. So if that's something that you would like to do to investigate if your idea has legs and to give it form and structure, that's exactly what I'm here for for you. Simply go to angelaraspis.com forward slash clarity and see if that session's a great fit for you. So let's move forward, shall we? Let's have a listen to what Becky has to share with us when she turns into frantic mummy and becomes this beautiful VA who helps women her own clients from all over the world. I hope you enjoy it.
Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Your Next Chapter podcast. I've been really looking forward to the, the conversation that we're going to have today with the gorgeous Rebecca Flansberg from Minnesota, who is known as Frantic Mummy. And I'm really looking forward to digging down into all the different aspects of her business and life to find out what makes her tick and helping other women escape from the cubicle to a whole new next chapter. Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. I am so excited to talk to you today. And our conversation already started before we hit the record button and uh, just comparing notes about how many commonalities and similarities there are between our lives. And I think one of the pieces that when you um, apply to come and talk on the Next Chapter podcast that just made me laugh was, and I'll, and I'll quote this from um, the writing in front of me, at around age 45, I had this holy crap, my life is half over moment. And I asked myself <laughs> if I wanted to continue doing what I was doing and it sounds like it was a resounding no that uh, that next chapter was starting to open up for you could you talk to us about what was the before and what's the after well the funny thing is is um, I am a old mom with young kids we had our kids later in life and so right now we have a 10 year old girl and a 13 year old boy but back, you know, five years or so ago, I was working full time for what I call the man. I was working a nine to five job in the office products industry, of all things. And I had been in that industry for 30 years. It was uh, it started when I was 16. Other than picking sweet corn in the summers, it was the only job I'd ever had. And I had worked for two different companies. But it really, I, I felt a little stuck because I felt like it was the only skill I had. And, you know, after being in sales for 30 years, you either keep rolling along or you get burnt to a crackly crunch. And I definitely was feeling very burnt out. I was um, the place I was working for was not the best environment. It was um, not a real he healthy ha atmosphere. Um, you know, the, you know, when you have those moments that you go, uh oh, um, the universe is telling me I really need to make a change. And that kind of came to me probably a few years before I turned 45, but I was driving on my way to work and I was very tired, not real excited to go to work. And somebody coming from the opposite direction crossed, was starting to cross the center line. And as this car is coming at me at the last second, he swerved back into his lane and I had this mixed feeling of relief and disappointment. And I'm thinking, you know, disappointment that if, you know, he'd hit me, I got some time off of work. And I'm thinking that is really, truly messed up, Becky. <laughs> that is really some scary thinking. So you, you might want to start listening to your gut and listening to, you know, what your body is telling you. And I started just really having these moments of, you know, there's just got to be more for me out there. And I want to be more present for my kids. I think that was the biggest thing because I was dropping them off super early in the morning to, um, at daycare. I had to be to work at eight. I wasn't able to pick them up till close to six. By the time we got home, it was, you know, 630 going on seven after supper and baths, you know, hour and a half later, they're in bed. And I'm thinking, this is no fun. You know, I, our kids are hard won and hard fought. I don't want to just see them for an hour and a half every day. So I started thinking about, well, what options do I have? And you and I talked about this a little bit that, you know, I know I'm not alone in, in feeling this way, but I really did have this moment of, I have no options. This is all I know. This is all I've ever done. I've sell office products and paper clips and chair mats. And, you know, and who's going to hire me at, you know, mid, in my middle 40s with no college degree? So I thought, well, you know, I'm kind of a problem solver by nature. And I thought, well, you know what, I'll just make my own path in life. And at the time, I was very fascinated with social media. Um, it was just, you know, really ramping up as a popular tool and a great marketing um, tool. And I, I knew what I wanted to do, but I didn't know how to market myself. I knew I wanted to write. I'd been a blogger for years. I knew I loved social media. I was just fascinated with it, but I didn't know how to package that, make it pretty and make money from it. So I was voicing this dilemma to, um, I went to a, a seminar type thing for office products industry per, uh, people. And one of the speakers there was a very lovely woman named Chris Moore. And afterwards um, I'd gone up to her and I kind of told her my dilemma and she's like, oh, well you want to be a virtual assistant. And I had never heard that word 
until the moment it came from her lips. But once I had that word, I knew how to research. I knew how to find where to go for training. I knew how to find, you know, air, uh, discussion boards where people were talking about it. I knew how to do some research and look for places to find clients. I knew enough to be able to move forward on starting to build this business. And that's basically what you're doing. When you work from home, you build a business. So that's how it all began. And I love that idea that um, you were recognizing what was going on inside. I think a lot of women have that sort of little voice that's starting to tap them on the shoulder going, not happy, not happy, right. not happy. Right. But then we right. tend to dismiss it for a while. It's like, well, I can't do anything about it. Like this is this is right. my, this is my lot. This is the way it is. And but right. what you did was that you began to open to that to that new possibility and, and really started to. One of my guests in the past talked about the body barometer that you started to tune yeah. into that into that body barometer. And yeah, I guess the car crossing the road was a real wake up moment. That oh, got, definitely <laughs> anything to get me out of going to work here again exactly yeah mm -hmm. so, you know and, the th and go ahead I was just wondering when you started to to do that that gentle investigation as to what you could do I mean we often have that inner voice that critical inner voice that's that's trying to tell us what we can't do was that something that you were aware of and needed to deal with yes absolutely because the the thing the kicker for me was the fact that the job I had Although it was a miserable job and I was not enjoying it, it paid really good. It's kind of like the golden handcuffs. You, you don't enjoy your job, but they pay you good so you feel like you have to stay. Plus, I had two small kids at home. Plus, at the time, my husband was also self-employed. So I was the main breadwinner of the family. And to this day, I still am the main breadwinner. I'll just have you know. <laughs> but but um, it was kind of a gutsy, silly, you must be crazy, move, what are you thinking, but I also come from a place, and I credit my parents for this, that, you know, that problem solver. Okay, I'm miserable. I can either sit in the corner and suck my thumb and be miserable about it, or I can fix it. What can I do? What can I do to make this situation better? And the situation being how I earned a living. And I wanted to earn an honest living, and it wasn't so much as to, you know, getting rich or making six figures as it was for being present for my kids and having the flexibility for them. So, you know, I was a, I now as a work from home mom, I can, I'm here to get them off to school. I'm, you know, here to get them, you know, pick them up from school at three, help with homework. If somebody's sick, no big deal. I don't got to beg for time off from a boss. I just go, okay, you know, here's some Tylenol. Go to your room. I'll check on you a little bit. And I just keep on working. And, and um, you know, it's just, it's such a, it's the season of parenthood goes so quickly. And I just didn't want to wish away, wish up the fact that I wish I would have spent more time with my kids when they're graduating school and I had just been too consumed with work. I wanted that option of going, yes, I can volunteer in your class. No big deal. I don't got to ask the boss because I am the boss. That's the part that I love about working for myself. I haven't, yes. I haven't had an, a boss apart from me um, since my son was born. So it's it's seven, right. seventeen years that I've been toing and froing before I started my business proper back in two thousand and three. But one of the things that I loved about what you just said, um, Becky, was that you recognized that you had choices and it was the quality of the questions that you began to ask yourself. Um, so you said, what can I do to make this situation better? And you had a very high awareness of what was important to you in terms of being present for your children. I love that expression that the season of parenthood, it's a short yes. one. I'm recognizing that now myself as yes, well. Yes, very much so. So you asked the questions that opened possibilities. I call that skylight thinking. So it's when you ask a question, that has that expansiveness about it, that almost you're asking yourself an open-ended question, you find that your brain sort of kicks in and starts looking for answers and furnishing you with answers, where conversely, if you if you allow yourself to think, well, there isn't any options and I'm stuck here, you can feel the weight and the heaviness and the constriction of that sort of dialogue with yourself. So those questions right. that you're answering really started to open doors for you, yeah? Yes, I love that term, skylight thinking. That's excellent. And I think when you're when you're taking action to better your life, there's something very empowering about that. If you just do nothing and sit in status quo, 
you know, you, this is your one go round in life. You, it, it's your choice how you want to do it. If you want to stay in that nine to five job that sucks your soul, I am not going to sit there in judgment at all. However, we all as women or anybody have the power to go, you know what, I want something better. I want something different. And I don't think people are committed to need to be committed to one job or even one career for their life. I think life is meant to be experienced. Life is an adventure. So this was kind of my, my 40, when I hit 45, my, oh crap, my life's half over <laughs> moment. You know, I'm thinking, what do I want to do for the next chapter of my life for the second half of my life? And, and schlepping office products in a kind of a toxic environment was not high on my roster. And, um, you know, it is what it is. You know, one thing I try to tell people when they are going to leave a nine to five job is try to make that exit graceful. I call it the graceful exit. Um, my grace, my exit was not quite so graceful <laughs> and it was somewhat my fault, but somewhat the employer's fault. But I think the, it came down to the fact that I tried to hang in there too long and I was just so burnt out and so angry and um, it just didn't end as well as it could. So that's the one thing I think if I would turn back time a little bit, I would probably leave sooner, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, at, yeah. So at the time, I when I jumped, I didn't like jump without a net. I mean, when I left my very safe, secure, lovely job, I had um, worked that virtual assistant business for s six months doing both. And it had grown to the point where I couldn't do both anymore. So I left with clients and income in my pocket. So I wasn't coming and trying ground zero, trying to build this business and because my family depended on my income. Um, luckily, around that same time, my husband got a job with the school system. You know, God works in mysterious ways. And he uh, got a great, great job with the school system, which got great benefits because that's another issue is health insurance and things like that when you're self-employed. Absolutely. Actually, I'm really interested that that idea, I mean, the graceful exit aside, you had some great background, as you said, the way I guess you've been brought up, you had this particular way of looking at the world, but I want to explore for a moment of the people that were around you at the time. I'm a big believer in what I call belief buddies, so right. people people who who um, back you up and who encourage you, not recklessly, but who, right. get, who believe in you and, and hold your vision quite close to their hearts as well. Did you have some belief buddies or were you going it alone at the stage? No, I completely agree with you. You do need some sort of a belief buddy to not only kick you in the fanny when you need it, but also kind of talk you down off the ledge when you're starting to get spazzy and upset or scared or, or just unsure of yourself. And my belief buddy, one of the few people that I had told about my dream and my vision of leaving this job and going to work from home was my, um, I call her, you know, rock star Shannon. She's my best friend, Shannon. And she was just this amazing force that kept pushing me going, you know, you deserve this. You're better than this. You can make this happen. Of all the people I know, you have the online savvy, savvy the knowledge and the chutzpah to, to get this taken care of. So she uh, she's to this day even a great motivator for me. And she was absolutely without a doubt. Shannon Jenko was absolutely without a doubt um, the person that kept me going along. My husband, I, I say it's always critical to have your significant other on board. It took him a little longer because he really, he's more of the skeptic of the family. He just couldn't quite believe. I mean, he can't even turn on a computer. He couldn't quite <laughs> believe how I could take this mysterious box called a computer and make a living out of it. So I kind of had to do some proving for him, but by the time I did make the leap, um, he was on board and very supportive. You have to have that support of your spouse, otherwise you're like a fish swimming upstream. It is so much harder because you're just constantly, you know, having that tension and that resistance. So it took him a little bit, but he did get on board, and now I think he's very happy with where we're at in our life because you know he knows that somebody's always here for the kids, even though he's working, and um, it's just a great way to to manage a family yeah it does it feels good and and I um I very much share that that I'm, I'm fortunate of having that flexibility it's one of the things that I've really appreciated in the in the last year so being able to drop in and go to the school carnivals and picking yes. up the kids from here and there and and I remember like my kids are 17 and 13 now and 
I remember very clearly wanting to have the dialogue in the teenage years and that you know, when you've got the kids, or what I've experienced, when they're first home from school, I pick them up for the bus stops and, and train stations, that's when they chat. Chat, yeah. chat, 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 it, chat, chat, chat about the day. And it's like oh, you, yep. you gleam a lot from that. Yeah, it's awesome. And, you know, sometimes you think your brain might start to bleed because it's just like nonstop. But, you know, I just, it's like pure music to my ears. I just love hearing about all their silly stories and even the drama because I know, you know, I know in not that many years they will both be out of the house and on their own. So I just soak it all up. I'm just so grateful to be able to to be there for them. And I know they they appreciate it as well. Absolutely. Well, rock star Shannon is definitely gets a big tick um, as a, as a belief yes. buddy. That, that's fabulous. And, and just um, coming in from another angle for a moment, like you had a lot of clarity as to what your skill set was. You said you've been blogging for a while, for quite a while. And so freelance writing, as I understand, became a big part of the new you, the new you online. So finding those skills can sometimes be a challenge for people in terms of, well, that's great. You know, Becky had been blogging for ages and she got the social media thing it, it's easy to start a business in that in that way playing devil's advocate here for a moment how would right. you how would you encourage somebody to be able to find their skill set because I think your definition of a virtual assistant is a little different to perhaps what we have here in Australia um, if you can give us your definition because here it's it's it feels like it's more narrow in terms of what a VA is so what's your definition of a VA so we could see the different types of skills that that might involve well, I always tell people that whatever knowledge you have in your brain, whether it's knowledge from a job or knowledge about um, a life circumstance like adoption or infertility or uh, divorce even, there's somebody in the world willing to pay you for that knowledge because that knowledge is valuable. Um, to me, content is gold. Knowledge is, is extremely, extremely valuable and somebody is willing to pay you for that. So that being said, I, I tell people, focus on what you, make a list, sit down and write everything you know something about. And maybe that's creating a newsletter. Maybe that is um, how to be an Uber driver, which I guess is a big, big thing these days. This is, maybe it's how to be a personal shopper. Maybe it's how to be a de graphic designer and design logos. Maybe you're a wizard at at bookkeeping and you um, were a bookkeeping a bookkeeper at a job somewhere all of those are skills that there are businesses and individuals somewhere in the world that is they are willing to pay you for that knowledge and that's the beauty of online the online world you're not limited by your zip code or your you know your state or anything you can do business with people everywhere you can do business vir when they say virtual assistant that's what it is you're doing business with someone virtually anywhere in the world and and you can and the thing about me when I started out as a virtual assistant I pretty much focused on social media because I felt that was my strongest skill and then also writing and blogging because I'd been doing it for years and that included writing for magazines what I found as as I worked with clients and I built up a rapport and a trust with them they would ask me do you know how to use one shopping cart or MailChimp or something like that and I would say no and they'd say let me show you so I was blessed with a lot of people who were more than willing to train me to do things so they didn't have to go out and hire a second person so it you know being a VA in the US it's it kind of is um, I wouldn't say it's infinite what the possibilities are but there's so many unique possibilities and there's people looking for the skills that you possess and that's where I think there is absolute gold in your definition, and and this is where our perspectives really blend together. The the, the typical um, textbook definition of a virtual assistant here in in our country has been more of the I can help you with those things. I can put your newsletter together. I can perhaps you know work on your website. I can create some social media images, update um, Facebook, etc. So it was very it was broad but narrow, so to speak. But what you've done is right. you've taken the definition and said, look at all of your skills. Not just, right. not just those online skills, which a lot of us don't necessarily have, but what has the experience been in your lifetime that you have gained this expertise around that you can then share? That, to me, is the, is the key part. I'm thinking of, for example, a lovely lady that I interviewed a few weeks back who's created a business called um, the Divorce Resource Kit, and because she had been through... Um, 
a fairly a fairly traumatic divorce and and recognizing all of the different aspects that people needed to understand to empower them to face the divorce proceedings and, and all the legal things you need to go through that's her business that's what she right. does now and there's so many other examples so what we're really saying is have a look back through your experiences and, and see which of those I think really importantly a could have a potential market but B you also feel comf comfortable and confident talking about and teaching right. about because you're further down the path perhaps than another person has been in that particular area I think when people think of virtual assistants they do think of things like social media and blogging because yeah. that seems to be the highest demand but behind the scenes these these uh, clients who need those services need a, a quite a plethora of other things help with other things as well so you know that's probably the the most foremost thing you see is I, I need a VA for you know graphic design or to build my website but there are people that will hire you just because you have expertise in the field of infertility and you can write about it you know it's it's really not that difficult once you kind of laser in on what your skills are to put something together where you can tell people, hey, this is what I can bring to the table for you. And the more things you have experience in, even if they seem kind of silly to you, the more valuable of a potential contractor it makes you. Absolutely. And so it's thinking, it's thinking broadly and it's making sure that this is where the belief buddy comes in as well or having a community around you that you don't devalue your skills because I right. think we, we quite often um, like I have another friend who her, her interior designer knowledge blows my mind she's just one of those people that you know you walk into her home and it's like am I in a magazine she's just it's what right. comes, comes naturally to her when you walk into my home and you're covered in magazines so it's very, <laughs> very different environment but because it comes so naturally and easily to her she devalues it it's like, right. well, you know, anyone can do it. Well, actually, no, they can't. Another friend who can create the most amazing desserts and cakes. I can eat them really well, but I'm not so good at creating them. So it's, again, it's that, yeah, but, you know, I can, I can just do that. Well, not everybody can. So having, right. having that belief buddy who can reflect back to you and let you know that these skills that you have are not necessarily what everybody else has. So you could actually create a business around them if you were so inclined. Absolutely. I agree with that completely. So how did the, the when you were taking your first steps into creating um, your new empire, what, what, were the, what were the most important steps for you to take to actually get, um, get some traction and start to find your positioning and attract your clients? How was that working for you? I would say when people ask me, you know, I'm just getting started, what should I do? I tell them, I tell them two things. Learn, learn as much as you can. Um, and invest in quality education, whether it's training, but the learning process should never stop for you because especially with social media, it changes like every five minutes. So if your um, skill set includes social media management, you better be continually looking for researching, reading, listening to podcasts to make sure you are the best you can be in that skill set. There's uh, several organizations. One is called IVA, I-V-A-A. -A. It's International um, Virtual Assistance Association. It's a nonprofit, but they are, it's like a membership group for virtual assistants. They have phenomenal training. And I highly recommend people to not try to cut corners to get the training that they need. And if you got to spend a little bit in the beginning. And then another one is called VA Networking, owned by Tanya Sutherland. Her um, workshops and classes are spectacular as well. I tried, I thought I was being clever by kind of piecemealing my um, trainings together, a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit of hodgepodge here, and it took three times as long, and my learning curve was huge, and I probably spent far more than I should have than going to a place like IVA or VA Networking and just taking their all-inclusive one-shot deal on virtual assistant training now that's if you want to be a VA if that if you're going to be a graphic designer or a bookkeeper or whatever there's obviously training available everywhere but your your training should never stop your education should never stop you should always be trying to be the best version of yourself that you can be the second thing I would tell people is never stop prospecting even when I am I think I'm going to lose my mind busy I'm still always prospecting because the thing about being your own boss is you need to keep that sales funnel 
full, that lead funnel full, the potential clients coming, because they do come and go. I mean, some assignments with clients are, you know, it's a one and done. You don't you get done with the project and then you're you're done with them. So I, I tell people in some way, shape or form every day, even though you don't feel like you need to because you're slamming busy, do some prospecting. Even if it's sending um, an email to a past client saying, hey, I haven't heard from you in a while, anything you need help with, pitching a magazine about an article idea, going on a place like Upwork and just kind of scrolling through and seeing if there's anything you want to apply for. Because the worst thing you want to do is scramble for work when it dries up because you just you just always want to keep that that the work coming in. Um, to be able to turn down work is a is a beautiful thing, <laughs> but but you need to constantly be prospecting for work to get there. So that's the main two pieces of advice I give to people when they're first starting out, is um, never stop learning and never stop prospecting. Absolutely, I agree totally with both of those. I like to think of myself as a lifelong learner. That's I think that's part of the delight of having your own business yes. as well. It's um, I've actually got into my calendar on a weekly basis. I book in learning time. I don't feel guilty any longer. It's like this is part of who I am and, and what it is that or who I am becoming as well. So learning time, as far as I'm concerned, is an investment in myself and therefore in yeah, my business. It's an business. investment. Absolutely. And you just said it exactly. It's an investment in yourself, but it's also an investment in your business because you are a business owner and you are in charge of building your business. And, you know, it's it's up to you. No magic fairy is going to come along, wave her wand and things are going to go your way. You have to work for it. And it's just like building a brick and mortar business. They say the first five years is the hardest. I wouldn't say the first five years um, is the hardest for online. I suppose it depends on what you're doing. I say my first year was quite tough and it was a big learning experience and I made some expensive mistakes but once I found my groove it I just keep clicking along and every year it just keeps getting better and better and my clients keep getting better and better my income keeps getting better and better and I'll just keep growing it that way and that's actually that's a really important point just to dwell on for a moment because I think one of the um, challenges of the social media world when we're watching we have this ability to watch the outsides of other people's lives so often and we only see you know the highlight reel and that comes from a business perspective as well we can I've seen right. what I call the jackpot effect like you've seen some businesses or women that have started their businesses and suddenly it, it seems suddenly inverted commas kapow they've like taken off and they're huge and we only see See that that success but we don't see behind the door with all the work that's gone into getting them to that point and I think sometimes that can create unrealistic expectations about what is possible or what should happen in commas again in those first year or two of business do you find that as well absolutely it's it's a marathon it is not a sprint there is no corner cutting or instant quick fix or get rich and, you know in three days it doesn't work like that this is the real world you need to you need to work hard and put in the time I do caution people that you know the whole reason you're working from home is to not grind out 12 hour days and, and, uh, and ignore your family that wasn't the reason you started working from home so you have to learn to set boundaries for yourself and your family but um, but absolutely, I think I think I think that's just very possible. I love the idea of, of never stopping prospecting. I, I, I look at that from the perspective of what I call lead generation pipelines. So you need to have four or five different ways in which you can connect with potential clients. So if one pipeline dries up, you're not stuck in the desert. There's other ways right. that you can fall back on. What have you found have been some of your most successful ways of, of becoming visible to and therefore connecting and attracting your type of clients? You know, a lot of what I do has seemed to be word of mouth. I think once you get established and you work with clients, if they have friends that need help, you get a lot of referrals by word of mouth. LinkedIn has been a, a great source of me to connect with um, decision makers. I think, too, when you're, when you're doing something like working from home and kind of like what you said about keeping the pipeline full, I kind of look at it more of multiple streams of income. It's like your business is the hub of a wheel and the things you do to generate income are the spokes. So try to do more than once. Like I have my virtual assistant services. I have my magazine writing. I have my blogs that are monetized. I have, you know, on occasion I'll do speaking engagements, not real often. Um, I like affiliates. So I have these different ways 
of um, kind of like the um, the orchard the orchard of the apple trees, you know, that you have not just one apple tree, you have many. So they bear fruit in many different places. So that's kind of how I view it is if all possible, try to have a couple different ways of, of earning coming uh, income coming in. So if your virtual assistant business kind of gets a little slow right now, well, okay, maybe let me just dive into some magazine writing right now, or is there some affiliate sales I can make? And so there's always several several wheels turning that can bring in income for you. I think that's a great, I've got that visual really clearly. I can see that wee cartwheel turning along. And, and I know when, right. I, when I visited your site, there's fantastic examples of all the freelance writing that you've done. But yes, right. you also have a book Oh, and, a, and a, yes. a, a package about how to become a VA and those are products that are consistently on your website and that monetizing of the blog just for anyone listening that's like well how does that work uh, those are those little ads that I see down the side of your blog correct right yes you can have people can buy ad space from you and you can see those on the sidebar of my blog there's people that will come to you and um, pay you and go um, would you please review this product or Lately, I did a, a really good one. Um, now I can't think of the name of the app. This is really embarrassing. It was a really good, really good thing on recipes. And so they actually paid me a fee to review this app and write a blog post for them. And it was an hour's worth of work and it was um, very good money. So that's just a, yet another way to monetize. <coughs> another mo way to monetize your website or your blog is to sell products like I've done with my freelance freedom book and I have a couple little ones too there are a couple 99 centers but but it's very doable on if you have a website or a blog I think they're one and the same these days there's definitely it's your real estate and there's definitely ways to make money from it if you do your research and um, put in the time um, you can't you know start a blog in a month and expect people to buy a five hundred dollar ad from you. You need to kind of put in the time and develop a track record, develop a readership. You need to have that social proof that hey, I'm out here. People are coming to my site and reading my stuff. For you to ha be able to charge a, a good price for ads and, and whatnot. So actually, just on that topic of of traffic, um, i.e., people coming to your blog, coming to your website. When you've been running for quite a while, as you have, you've got that natural traffic that, that's there, and so you can continue to capitalize it and build on it. But what about someone that's just starting off? Do you have any tips on, on how to begin to attract that traffic? You know, there's several different things you can do. When you first start out on writing on a, on a blog, the best thing you can do is, you know, get pick social media pick I try to tell people don't try to be everywhere at once pick one or two pick just Twitter pick just Pinterest or just Instagram and just be present on those social media channels and that doesn't mean sharing a hundred percent all your stuff it's not all about you it's not me 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 my 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 you need to put in some time sharing other people's things sharing fun tips that maybe your readership would be interested in but it does take some time to build that social proof you can also set up um, a subscription so people can subscribe to your blog so every time you um, post something and hit publish they get an uh, email in their inbox going hey there's more cool stuff at frantic mommy so then they click through and, and go and see Another thing that I found very helpful is Facebook groups. There are lots of Facebook groups out there, specifically bloggers helping other bloggers. Um, you know, you support each other, um, go to each other's blogs and comment, which is a great way to catch attention. So that's probably the, the three main down and dirty, quick and easy. There's a multitude of other ones, but that's a good way to get started. Just get established on one or two social media channels and then just be seen. Be seen in some of the groups. Be seen um, on social media. Be seen in the comment area of other people's blogs and just keep working it. Again, it's not a sprint. It is more of a marathon. It does take time. It's a definitely it's an evolution as well. How have, yes. how have you found from when you first began Frantic Mommy compared to today? How have you evolved? What, what changes have you seen? Because I think a lot of people uh, sort of procrastinate. We hold back until we get it right before we launch. Right. Yeah, there is some of that um, paralysis that comes from wanting perfection. But have you seen a, a definite evolution in the way that your business and yourself have developed as a business owner? I would say definitely yes. You know, the the more you're in business or the more you blog, whatever you're working on, you know, time and experience brings wisdom. 
So you learn from your mistakes, you learned what works, you learned what don't works. I think for anyone who's just starting a blog, there I read somewhere once that the average blog only lasts two months because people get frustrated, give up, they lose interest. And I've been doing it for 10 years. So I've hung in there a tremendously long time. And, you know, has Frantic Mommy kind of evolved a little bit over the years? It has to some degree. I've always kind of maintained that my voice and my style, which is a little edgy and definitely very goofy. And um, that's how I, the more conversational I am, I think the more people enjoy reading what you have to say. And if you're finding a hot button, if you find that niche that people are looking for information on, whether it's autism, whether it's divorce, whether it's working from home, and if you just continue to give and share and um, be yourself, that word authentic is like overused, but it's very true. It, it just be yourself, be, be your authentic self. People will continue to come back for more and it'll just keep growing. That's such a great point. And I know that, yes, the word authentic does get bandied around a lot, but it comes back to that um, when you are who you are. And as you're saying, you know, your style is, <clears throat> excuse me, is a little edgy and a little goofy. You tend to, when you're radiating that authenticity, you attract the people that are what I call a most aligned client for you. I think sometimes right. we try and be all things to all people or, or keep things a bit vanilla because we're not right. you know, wanting to, I think women in particular, and I know this may be a bit of a, a stereotypical statement, but it's certainly what I've seen and I've seen it in myself as well. There's the fear of criticism. There's the, the yes. desire to keep everyone happy and not, yes. to, not to stand out too much. And so that can vanillarize the way that we show up online sometimes. And then we can't resonate. We can't, right. you can't connect with and really stand out and attract the people that you are most here to help because they can't recognize you in your writing or in the way that you are portraying yourself online. So really letting the, the goofy, the edgy, the whatever it is that describes you of who you really are, if you can release that out online, then you're really going to start to get that traction over time. I call it the you factor and I've had people tell me, oh, I don't know if I want to write about autism or gluten-free recipes because it's everybody else is doing it. And I said, yes, but they don't have the you factor. No one can imitate you. No one can imitate the perspective and the voice and the style that you bring to that particular topic. So right in that moment, it becomes unique because you are you. No one can duplicate you. You add your your taste, your flair, your whatever you want to call it to whatever you're offering and no one will ever duplicate that. And the more fun and fresh you can be, in my opinion, the more readable you will be. I love that how you were saying before about the, the conversational style that you've weaved yes. in because we don't need the formality online right. and the way that we were often taught to write back in our school times you know that that formality is it we're not writing an essay we're not writing right. you know an assignment we're having a chat it's just that it happens right. to be in pixels as opposed to to print and i people um i always tell people try to write you know when it's your blog you can say whatever you want to say this is your real estate you can even curse if you want to you may lose a lot of people that way but hey it is your real estate so I just tell people that, you know, um, just be true to yourself and try to not pretend you are someone else because you can't keep that up for long. And um, just, just, yeah, I guess that's the main thing is just be yourself. Yeah, and that part there that you just said, be yourself because you can't keep it up for long being someone else. Right. Oh, my goodness. There's too much energy that's involved yes. in like projecting what you think you should be like online or out there in the world. Just, yeah, relax. <laughs> and you that, know, and I think, I think people are pretty savvy these days, too. They can smell the BS factor pretty yeah. quickly. <laughs> so if you're not being your true self, I think you're going to get found out eventually. Absolutely. I think that brings us full circle to that, to that one of the topics we were talking about a little earlier about valuing yourself because that self-doubt can, can pop in and go, yeah, but who, who, who's going to want to hear from me? Well, right. it's, it's a big world. It is a big yes. connected world these days. You'd be amazed. I think even myself with um, some of the feedback and emails that, land in my inbox about this podcast you know i'm very big in alaska <laughs> no, I'm oh, is that right congratulations <laughs> and you just get these um you know stray emails that come from little pockets of the world you right. never have any idea 
about who you're impacting, the ripple effect right. of what it is that you're doing. Because I know that there's a lot of people that you know that read things that are in Facebook groups that are listening who don't necessarily send the email or give the feedback, but nevertheless, you are impacting them. And right. that, that comes from that real genuine connection and someone listening to you and, and, it, and it can change their world. You can change someone's world just by a blog post they've read of yours or an episode that they've listened to. And so that really understanding, as you said so beautifully, they don't have the you factor. Right. You, you've got the you factor. So allowing that out in everything you do, you will connect with the people who are most aligned for you. I have a huge, huge belief in that. But let, Becky, let's come around to the uh, one of the things I'd like to highlight is some of the brilliant resources that you have on your website to help women who are first stepping into this next chapter where they want to explore this idea of, hey, maybe I do have some skills that I can utilize in that virtual assistant capacity. Can you talk to us about where those resources are and, and how they can help? You bet. On Frantic Mommy, which is kind of my primary site, well, it is my primary site, and it's Frantic Mommy is all one word. There's several different things. I have something called my WAM toolbox, and WAM is stands for Work at Home Mom. But in that WAM toolbox, you'll find all sorts of things like tips, you know, tools that I've tried that makes life easier, whether it's Bluehost or Dropbox or Aweber or something like that. There's a whole series I've done, a blog post series called What It Takes to Be a Virtual Assistant. So the links are in there. I've tried to stuff it full of just free, really good information to take the guesswork out of things for people. So that's definitely one. And also on my sidebar, there's something I have called the free, the free VA starter kit, and that's the free virtual assistant starter kit. It's a completely free giveaway little report that I've written up with just kind of just an outline of what do you need to do to get out of the gate to pursue your virtual assistant business, everything from what do you need for equipment? What to expect when you're working from home? Where can I find clients? And I think I even have, I'm almost positive, I still have a, a copy of the virtual assistant contract in there. So if you have a, an agreement between yourself and a client, it's a very templated form, but it, it helps just to put everything on paper so there's no misconceptions. And that's completely free. So I love giving that to people. I get people all the time saying, I want to be a VA. How do I get started? And I say, go get that starter kit it's crammed full of super good stuff and then the, another thing i have and this is available on amazon it's called the freelance freedom freelance resource success guidebook and it's an ebook and it's on, on amazon like i said and it's uh it's over 80 pages i can't remember correct um exactly but that that one is really full and it's more generalized to being someone who's a freelancer. And a freelancer could be a freelance bookkeeper, freelance graphic designer, freelance, um, you know, writer like myself. Basically, you're working as an independent contractor, not an employee. But in the pages of this book, there's things like, you know, importance of um, balance, work family balance, you know, the unicorn that everybody's looking for. <laughs> steps to take, steps to take before you quit your job and work from home. Your skill set toolbox, which is kind of a fun way to help you write down those skills that you think maybe nobody cares about. I bet you they probably do list them all out. Um, working at home, just what to expect, how to find clients, um, writing for magazines, bookkeeping and taxes, which is kind of a big one. Different terminology. Then there's a whole bunch of um, recommended reading, education resources, um, links to conferences, top influencers, just things like that. I tried to really gear it for women and moms who are looking for an option to do whether they're working from home with kids. Um, little kids are harder, but it's still very doable or something to do to generate income while the kids are at school. That kind of between drop off and pick up. I, I got, you know, six hours before the kids are home. What can I be doing to maybe generate some income? And so it kind of gives some ideas on that too. So yeah, that's um, I'm, that's been uh, a work in progress for many years, but I'm really excited that it's now on Amazon. Oh, that sounds fabulous. And there's a great depth in the tools and the and the resources and the guidance that you're providing there, which right. is very, very generous. So right. thank you on behalf of a lot of women who I know will be oh, jumping in there. I love to overgive. Uh, somebody told me once that you get to where you want to in life by helping others do the same. So I've always really believed that I'm going to give it all to you. Here, Here's everything. I'm not holding back. So and if you have questions, just ask me. I ask, answer emails, 
you know, several times a week, people email me questions. I'm not sure how to do this. Hey, no problem. I'll help you. Yeah, I'm not that- going to make not going to make you buy a con- consultation package. I'll answer your question, <laughs> you know. Well, and it's people that, appreciate that. And it's the abundance mindset that that brings is, you know, because yes. that's one of the beautiful things about the internet is how it has opened the world of opportunities to us. And as we, you know, as we were talking about before, you're not ba- you don't have those, those geographical boundaries any longer. You can literally help and work with and connect with people all over the world. Right. And yep. so that abundance mindset is, is a wonderful one to have. There's enough work out there for all of us. I'm not a believer in competition because of, as you highlighted, the U-factor. You know, I, as a as a business and life mentor for women in their next chapters, I'm not the only one. <laughs> I'm certainly not. There's thousands and thousands of people who are business mentors, but they don't have my particular flavor. And so there'll be parts of the audience that resonate with the way that I show up in the world, and there'll be lots of people who resonate with others. And so I'm a huge believer in that giving and abundance as well, and connecting people with the people that are most likely to be able to help them. So you and I definitely share that philosophy. Yes, I agree with you completely. If a, someone comes to me, a client, and says, do you know how to do this? I, and I don't. I will tell, be very honest with them and say no. But I'll also say, but I can refer you to somebody who can. It does, yeah. So, yeah, so just that helping hand, not slam the door shut in their face because they're going to remember that and maybe something else will come up and they'll come back to you and go, hey, you helped me last time. How about this? Can you help me with this? So, yeah, those cultivating relationships take take different forms and it can be as simple as something like that, giving a good referral or just helping somebody along because somewhere down the road they might have a client that they're going to redirect back to you. It's all about connections. It is completely. So we can find you on the Frantic Mummy website and I'll make sure the links both to the resources and to your site are on the podcast page as well. But what's the social media platform that you play in most often that we can go and connect? I'm definitely a lover of Twitter, and you can find me on Twitter as Rebecca Flansburg. That's Rebecca without the A, Flansburg, F is in Frank, L-A-N-S-B-U-R-G, on Twitter. I love Twitter. Uh, I also am kind of a freak when it comes to Instagram. <laughs> you find me on Instagram. I don't do so much for business. I probably should, but that's under Frantic Mommy as well. So those two places are always good places to see what I'm up to. Fantastic. And can I ask, as we're coming to the end of this particular wholehearted conversation, you've you've sparked some interest without a doubt in our listeners of thinking who perhaps haven't yet walked into their next chapter, that, that possibility of maybe I can use my skill set, maybe there is an opportunity here for me to, to walk down a different path. What would you like to leave as the final thoughts to encourage people to take that leap or even to realign themselves if they're in one direction and thinking you know what the body barometer is pulling me in another direction so what would you leave as some last thoughts or inspiration to encourage them to take that leap i would just say that we are the orchestrators of our own life so if you're in a position where you feel unfulfilled in a job or you're just burnt out or you're unhappy or it's just like i said before sucking your soul You know, instead of just putting up with it because you feel you don't have options, the truth is you do have options. You just need to sit down, open your mind, and really think about what you want to do for the second half of your life. And maybe it doesn't involve working from home. Maybe it involves go working with animals or kids or working in a garden. Just sit down and kind of frame out what that looks like. And then start taking that steps in that direction. Even if it feels like itty bitty baby steps, even if it feels like millimeters, it's still forward movement. And work on a little bit by little bit until you have a clear picture of what you want to do for the next chapter in your life. Absolutely. I love that. And, and those, those last thoughts, even if they're baby steps or turtle steps, yep. as uh, yep. Martha Beck says, it's still forward direction. You're still moving. I love, yeah. love Martha Beck. Love her. <laughs> yeah, I'm an absolute, absolute devotee and fan as well. I have every one of her books. Yep. I think she's fabulous. She is. Well, Becky, thank you so much for, for sharing your experiences with us. I mean, the, the enthusiasm with which you have stepped into your next chapter is definitely the piece that's inspiring. But it, I mean, it's been shot through with some real realism as well. Like as you right. said, you didn't just like leap and you know right. and just go bugger it, I'm out of here. You you <laughs> you did some planning and you really assessed, you know, what are the skills that I've got? What is it that's important to me? Where do I want to be? Or that most important question, you know, do I want to spend the second half of my life in this inverted commas soul sucking job? Yeah. <laughs> and and you backed yourself. Backing yourself is the biggest piece, I think. Having that self belief. Yeah, having that self-belief, having that trust and thinking, what's the worst that could happen? 
you know, I might have to go back and get a job again. Fine. Exactly. Fine. Yeah. And at least, yeah. at least you'll know. I mean, I think it'd be a bigger crime to never try. I don't think failure is trying and, and having it not work out. Failure is not ever trying. I think you should just owe it to yourself to give it a shot. And if it doesn't work out, okay, well, you try it. That's awesome. That was a good challenge, a great adventure. What do I want to do next? Perfect. Well, thanks again, my darling. And I'll put up those links so that we can all chase the frantic mummy and get some more inspiration. So thank you very much again. Well, thank you so much for having me. This has been an absolute blast. <laughs> You're so welcome. And thank you, our lovely listeners, for tuning in and listening to another episode of the Your Next Chapter podcast. I hope you have found inspiration in this piece again for you to open up to what's possible for you in your own next chapter. So I look forward to sharing more stories with you next week. And thanks again for your time. Have a lovely day. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Your Next Chapter podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please let me know. Pop over to AngelaRaspis.com to subscribe to the show and leave a review. And whilst you're there, you can also enjoy valuable free resources, including show notes and downloads, along with the Next Chapter community, where you can connect with other wholehearted women on the same journey as you. We'd love to welcome and support you as your next chapter unfolds. See you next time.